embark on a journey of inspiration and discovery with the Purdue Lecture Hall Series, proudly presented by the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. Join us as we delve into the remarkable odysseys of these aspiring scientists, each crafting their own narrative in the world of science and groundbreaking research. Take a glimpse into their diverse cultural backgrounds and the journeys that brought them to Purdue University. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Director of Scientific Strategy and Relations of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on the Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Christopher DiTernaltes, who is a graduate student in botany and plant pathology uh, with uh, Professor Guahong Kai in plant pathology and genetics. Christopher's research is anchored in the complex interactions that govern the relationships between host, pathogens, and environmental variables. His academic journey has been devoted to deciphering the genomic underpinnings of soybean resistance against seedling disease pathogens, a pursuit that hinges on the meticulous application of genome-wide association studies and quantitative trait loci association mapping methodologies. Uh, it is such a pleasure to welcome you, Chris. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. Tell us about this awesome research. And I really want to hear a little bit about, you know, what led you down this path to uh, study these host pathogen and environmental interactions. Uh, such an awesome, awesome field. Tell us about it and welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Soros, for the more than an generous introductions. It's really my pleasure to be on uh, here today. I'm a big fan of the series, and I find myself coming back to it anytime I need a little inspiration from my fellow grad students on just some of the exciting research that's going on in, in at Purdue. And I'm, I'm glad to finally be a part of it and uh, to share my insights uh, into the fascinating world of plant pathology. Awesome. Um, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Perfect. Perfect. And as I typically do, I'll turn myself off and let you take the spotlight. Wonderful. So can you see that all right? All right. Awesome. So as Dr. Soares mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Dietrinaltis, and I'm a PhD student in Botany and Plant Pathology Department here at Purdue. And uh, I'm currently under the supervisor, uh, Dr. Gu Hong Kai, who's a USDA ARS scientist and also an adjunct faculty through Purdue. And so I thought I'd start my talk today a little bit different than some of the other lecture hall series um, talks that I've seen, because I recognize that while plant pathology has a tremendous impact on the world, it's not always the most visible of sciences. <laughs> so for those in the audience outside of agriculture, I realize this topic might not be entirely familiar and so I'd like to start by discussing what plant pathology is and what we do as plant pathologists. And then before I delve into how I got here and the current research that, uh, that I'm working on. So, so there we go. All right. So every organism, at least that I'm aware of, gets sick. And plants are no exception to this rule. So just like humans can get bacterial infections from tiny little microbes that are trying to get a free meal at your expense, um, there are thousands of pathogenic microbes that have evolved to parasitize plants in, in the exact same way. Um, talking about getting a free meal from a host. So plant pathology is the study of those microbes and the consequent disease um, they cause after infection. So to speak broadly, we can define disease as any pathogenic organism or environmental stressor that adversely is affecting the form or function of the plant host away from its normal kind of healthy state. And as plant pathologists, we tend to stick more to the microbes and the abiotic stresses. There's also a couple of other factors that obviously impact plant health, things like insects and uh, weeds in the field. Um, can greatly reduce yield, um, but those are more the, the field of entomology and weed science. So as pathologists, we're more concerned with the microbes as well as um, the environmental stressors, things like 
herbicide injury and ozone damage and all, all of the abiotic factors that go into disease. And then as well as the means to prevent um, the plant from becoming diseased as a result of all of these factors. So the idea of studying sickness is pretty easy to understand in humans because we can all unfortunately relate to the experience of illness. So we cough, we sneeze, we run fevers. And when we do, we can usually call on the help of others and describe you know, uh, how we're feeling. And if we have the good fortune and privilege, uh, we can get a diagnosis and hopefully get medicine to treat whatever's uh, causing the disease for us. With plants, it's a little bit different. Um, they can't tell us what's wrong with them. I hope that's pretty obvious. Um, and it's not always immediately clear uh, when plants are actually sick. Um, it can take careful observation to notice all of the signs and symptoms of plant disease, especially if we wanna catch it early, which is critical to kind of managing and preventing disease from becoming an epidemic on the plants that we wanna protect. Um, and so whereas the majority of pathogens of humans are bacterial, when it comes to plants, the majority of pathogens are actually fungi. Um, but like humans, there's an exception to this trend. And so we also deal with viruses and bacteria and sometimes even other uh, plants that have uh, evolved to parasitize um, plant hosts. And we also have to deal with microbial worms called nematodes and primitive bacteria called molecules. And then also there's a group called the protozoans, which are flagellated little microbes. And all of these things are parasites on various uh, plant hosts and lead to the diseased condition. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the, the striking examples of plant pathology all around us. So in each of the, the pictures here on this slide, as well as the next, um, all of the photos were taken from around here in West Lafayette, the Purdue main campus. Um, and so as a tangent, I was actually warned as a plant pathologist um, that I would start to lose a sense of the beauty of the plants around me and tend to only notice the disease. But luckily, the, the, the charm of the, the beauty has not, has not uh, passed yet. So. <laughs> so on the left here, we can see um, rust on what's called common jewelweed. And so uh, it's clear how this pathogen is uh, causing a disruption of the form of this, this plant. So this stem should look like this normal healthy tissue above and below where the uh, pathogen is actively growing. This kind of dusty, big tumorous mass is, um, is a gall that the, the pathogen has formed. And this is a uh, hypertrophic uh, tissue that the pathogen is synthesizing growth regulators and causing this, this plant to develop abnormally. We can see this 90 degree kink in the stem and the plant is trying to desperately reach back up because uh, this was actually found in Horticulture Park um, underneath uh, some dense shade trees, as well as a lot of jewelweed as its neighbors. And so this plant is actually losing competitiveness um, because it is sick um, and it is no longer able to reach sunlight like it normally would if it was not infected um, by this pathogen. On the right of that, we see uh, a very common uh, fungus and this is responsible for a condition called ergotism. So it's more commonly referred to as ergot um, and it synthesizes some pretty nasty mycotoxins. So uh, a lot of these are known because it is a precursor to LSD, um, but if it's the um, ergot alkaloids that are also synthesized by this fungus are toxic uh, to mammalian tissues and it causes necrosis and vasoconstriction and just a lot of bad um, symptoms on both humans and livestock that are fed contaminated grains. So when this fungus takes over, it actually replaces the seed of the grain, um, and that could be wheat. Uh, in this case, it's wild rye. Um, and so that obviously leads to a, a reduction in fitness for the plant host, um, because every time a sclerotia, which is this fungal structure that I'm highlighting here, um, replaces a seed, that's one less seed that the plant um, can produce and can grow on to form the next uh, generation. And so here we have a, a pathogen that's actually interfering with the reproduction of a plant. And so the next two images are of leaf spots and I um, they're actually caused by two different fungi, but they may look very similar. Um, obviously the hosts are different, uh, but the, uh, the symptomology is very, very similar. We see a, kind of a central tan portion 
of these lesions, which are actually necrotic patches of uh, host tissue, as well as these kind of yellow rings on the on the red bud tree that I've got here, and as well as these yellow streaks on the Solomon seal. Um, and that is a condition that we call chlorosis, which is uh, the pathogen actively degrading the chlorophyll um, in the leaf tissue. And so that's important because chlorophyll is, is necessary for photosynthesis and plants need to photosynthesize to make their own sugars. And if they can't do that, well, that can lead to stunting. Um, and if it's a, a crop that's being grown for grain or harvest, um, it will uh, can reduce the yield. And so I actually lied earlier when I said these were all from West Lafayette, I, ju I just realized this uh, image on the right is um, of daughter. And this is actually an example of a parasitic plant. So daughter is this kind of spaghetti, orangey looking plant material that's on top of the green tissue. And it has actually lost the ability to photosynthesize. And so instead what it does is it vines around a host and then it pierces their stem and then it sucks the nutrients out of the other plant and gets a free meal and reproduces and goes on and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's merry way. And so this is kind of an interesting example because I don't think a lot of people realize that, you know, uh, plants can actually parasitize other plants and be considered, uh, considered pathogens as well. And so each of these disease samples also has a, a pathogen associated with it um, that we can look at underneath the, the microscope. And that can tell us a little bit more about why the plant is diseased and hopefully get us a little bit closer to the, to the diagnoses um, as to what's going on and what's causing the disease in the plant. And so we do this by observing um, the structures of the pathogen in combination with the symptoms. Uh, something that I get a lot is people will send me, friends will send me pictures of their gardens or sick house plants, and then they'll ask me, what, what's the problem and how do I stop it? And a lot of the time I, I can't really help them. Um, plants have a very limited way of responding to pathogens by way of symptoms. And so a lot of different pathogens end up causing the same symptoms on the host. So speaking of like those leaf spots that I showed earlier, um, they're very similar symptoms and the plants are responding in similar ways, um, but we actually have different pathogens um, involved. So plant pathologists are involved in the diagnosis of these, these pathogens. Um, and it's very important for us to get accurate diagnoses um, because not all pathogens grow the same or have the same life cycle or sensitive to the same chemicals or have the same uh, optimal conditions in which they grow. So whenever we need to give management recommendations to try to reduce disease, um, an accurate diagnosis is a must have. Because if we tell a, a farmer or a grower or anybody that's interested in managing disease, um, a recommendation strategy, and it's the wrong pathogen, it might not work. And these things have costs associated with them. Let's say, you know, if you're spraying a fungicide or are deciding whether or not you're going to get rid of the plants, um, and then replant with something that's healthier. So highlighting that, I have this photo on the top left, which is another leaf spot. And whereas on the previous slide, they were um, Discosia species, as well as Phyllosticta species, which are both fungi. This one is caused by a species of Colatotrica. And looking underneath the microscope for these structures gives us that diagnosis. They have these characteristic, um, what are called setae, and uh, as soon as a plant pathologist sees this, we, under we understand that uh, uh, what the diagnosis is. We also have um, Ustilago matus, which is a uh, common corn smut, which is actually the exception to this rule. So seeing uh, symptoms like this, we see large fungal structures and it's pretty obvious that uh, uh, no other pathogen causes symptoms like this. Um, and so we can get to a diagnosis very quickly. Um, at the bottom here, we have two uh, kind of cryptic pathogens, uh, which may not immediately tell you that the plant is diseased. So on, on the bottom left, we have an Ohio buckeye, which is um, covered in something called powdery mildew. And uh, this fungus lives on the surface of the host and just kind of gives it a gray appearance, but otherwise the plant looks pretty healthy. So if you weren't familiar with the plant, you may not even know that this was a disease condition. But again, if we look underneath the microscope, we see those telltale structures and we go, oh, no, this is actually a pathogen. 
And finally, I have this, uh, this hawthorn berry, which is infected with another species of rust. And if you were looking at it, you may uh, think that it's just a highly decorated fruit. We have sweet gum, gum trees here on the Purdue main campus. I've superimposed an image of them and they kind of have those horns that stick out. You might be tempted to think that, uh, you know, maybe that's just the way that the fruit is. But again, we take it under the microscope, we see these telltale spores and we figure out um, that it's a pathogen. So, so back to the, the origin of plant pathology. So humanity's history with plant pathogens is long and it's complex, and it dates back to the origins of agriculture. As soon as humans began cultivating crops, um, they encountered diseases. And so before all this wonderful scientific knowledge that I used to get to a diagnosis on the previous slide, um, we weren't really sure what was to blame for the plants dying and the frequent famines that plant diseases caused. Um, and so we refer to this as the fatalistic period of plant pathology um, because plant diseases were often attributed to the wrath of the gods and many various gods. And to highlight that, I have this picture on the lower left here. This is of a, a Roman calendar and we can see etched into it a, a small, hopefully that's visible, the writing Robigo. And Robigo is actually the female form of a god who was the literal personification of agricultural disease. And so every April, the Romans would hold a festival called Robigalia, and they performed sacrifices and celebrated and feasted in the hopes that they could appease this god um, to prevent outbreaks of, of disease on their crops, mainly wheat, which was the staple crop of the Roman period. On the right, we have uh, a painting by Matthias Grunwald, um, and this was entitled the, the Temptation of St. Anthony. And so ergotism, if you remember the, the picture I showed of the ergot um, on the previous slides, is a result of eating contaminated grain that um, ergot has infected. And so, like I said, it causes vasoconstrictions um, in mammals, and so this often leads to blood flow being cut off in the extremities, which causes the, the tissue to die, and then it becomes gangrenous. And so we can see in this photo, a depiction of the awful suffering of, of somebody who has uh, consumed ergot and, uh, uh, and uh, how it was associated with the religious iconography of St. Anthony being tempted by demons and the devil and uh, when actually it uh, was likely a, a, a plant disease. So it wasn't until the 19th century that plant pathology really developed as a scientific discipline. And this is a period in time that a lot of scientific fields can point to kind of as their renaissance, especially being in the biological sciences. This is around the time um, that Darwin's theory of evolution was becoming popular and um, becoming standard thinking um, in biology. So even up until this point, um, talking about the 1800s, uh, the theory that germs cause disease rather than being simply a product of disease, in other words, when we saw fungal structures from diseased tissue, was this a pathogen was, or was this a symptom of the disease? Um, it was common thinking that uh, uh, these things spontaneously generated um, as, as a result of disease rather, as the, rather than as the cause of the disease. So the cause of disease was still actually seen as a mystery. But uh, three figures around this time really paved the way for the end of fatalism. And uh, they all made their contributions interestingly around the uh, 1860s, excuse me. And so first up, we have Anton de Berry. He was one of the first plant pathologists to prove um, that the cause of potato late blight, which caused this, this famine that I'll talk about next, um, was a result of the Phytophthora infestans that was associated with samples rather than the Phytophthora being a, a, a symptom of the disease. Louis Pasteur was known for uh, positing germ theory and disproving uh, spontaneous generation. And then we also had Robert Koch, who gave us um, criterion for how we could establish that these microbes that are associated with disease tissue are not actually symptoms, but the cause of the disease. And so this couldn't have come any sooner. Um, around that time, we were dealing, at, at humanity was dealing um, with some serious epidemics of agricultural diseases. So in the 1840s, 
I'm sure many people have heard about um, the Irish potato famine, and this is directly attributable to a pathogen called Phytophthora infestans, which had been introduced into um, Ireland about a decade earlier. And it causes the, the potato tubers to rot and become completely inedible. And this caused the death of, of millions of people and the emigration of even more um, away from their homelands. And so uh, agricultural disease has a long history of, of having a, a terrible impact on human civilization. Um, there's also economic impacts. I wonder how many people uh, know that Britain actually used to be the world's largest consumer of coffee, but it was an agricultural disease that uh, caused the cultural shift from drinking coffee as a caffeinated beverage um, to tea. And so uh, in the uh, 1700s, excuse me, 18, 1800s, most of the coffee that Britain was uh, importing was from the Ceylon region of Sri Lanka. And in 1870, a pathogen called Hymelia vastatrix, which causes what's known as coffee rust, was introduced into that region. And unfortunately, the plants were all susceptible. Um, the common varieties that were being grown were susceptible to this pathogen. And so by 1889, um, production uh, was, was pretty much halted. So in less than 20 years, most coffee plantations had been shut down because they could no longer grow coffee plants. Um, on, on those in those lands. And so we have this interesting example of uh, what you might call a piece of propaganda where the king was trying to uh, suppress coffee houses in an attempt to make tea more popular and to get the attention away from the fact that uh, uh, coffee imports were failing. And so this had huge economic effects and we see uh, as well as a cultural shift um, for both the producers and the growers. And um, Speaking from the ecological side, in the early 1900s, we had something called chestnut blight, which all but eradicated um, the uh, chestnut trees in North America. And so American chestnut was originally found in the Appalachian regions of uh, the USA. And it was a pathogen that took over. Um, and these trees turned out to be highly, highly susceptible um, to these pathogens. And it, it, it pretty much eradicated the species. Um, and so this, you know, we, we, we're still trying to understand the magnitude of um, the ecological impact the loss of a keystone species like that could be, but we do know that it's directly attributable uh, to, uh, to a pathogen. So I could go on for days about the history of plant pathology. I find it really fascinating, uh, but for time's sake, I think I should skip ahead a bit to the modern era. And so a lot has changed since uh, the discovery that DNA is the substance of heredity. We learned that certain varieties of the same species of plants re resist disease more um, than others, and that this resistance can actually be passed down um, to their progeny. So resistant plants have a tendency to give rise to more resistant plants. And so in the 1940s, um, we also discovered that every gene that a, a, a plant has that confers resistance um, a pathogen has a matching gene that is recognized by the plant host, and, and that's how the resistance uh, works. So what we get is kind of this development of an arms race, where every time a host develops a resistance gene, the pathogen tries to lose it or come up with another gene and evolve so that it can go back and infect, um, infect the host. And, and that's displayed in this diagram in the top right, where we have this constant zigzagging of resistance genes becoming ineffective and new pathogen races, as we call them, arising to, uh, to defeat these resistance genes. And uh, so I, I put up a simple mind map here to, to kind of highlight some of the, the various uh, topics of specialization within uh, plant pathology, but uh, it's, it's very simple and it's by no means exhaustive. Um, and so uh, when we talk about pathogen biology, we're, we're still very interested in learning about the life cycles and evolution and ecology of pathogens, but now a lot of plant pathologists focus on um, molecular biology. Since the advent of PCR to amplify uh, DNA and sequencing technologies, which we can use to decode that DNA, um, this has become a huge topic of study. There's always, once we find resistance genes, there's always pressure to get them into the varieties we like to grow. Um, ones that are high yielding and well adapted to the places where they're going to be grown. And so we have um, breeding as, as a, a subsection of 
plant pathology, where we're trying to get those resistance genes into new varieties. And this has been uh, assisted uh, with molecular biology, where we can now look at DNA to actually help speed up breeding and selection, as well as gene editing, where we can splice genes um, from one variety to another. There's always going to be pressure um, from disease, and so management is, is an important topic, and um, developing strategies that we can use to try to prevent disease epidemics from becoming um, as bad as uh, some of the, the famines and uh, other epidemics that I showed on the previous slide. And then we have epidemiology, which is really focused on trying to develop disease models to understand what factors lead to worse epidemics, as well as forecasting models that we can use to make decisions about management strategies based on things like how the season is gonna go, how the climate is, and when we expect disease pressure to be really high. And those feed into things like regulatory measures where we're trying to prevent the spread of pathogens into new areas. And so how did I get here as a plant pathologist? Um, I, I am by no means from an agricultural background. Um, I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, in a suburb that's pretty far away from the agriculture that's going on in that state. And so my experience of agriculture was primarily limited to field trips. Um, which you can see one of which was captured on film uh, and I'm playing with some dirt there and probably had eaten my weight in some fresh picked broccoli from the uh, from the field that we were visiting. Um, but one thing that did always connect me to agriculture was I had a, a love of gardening and specifically uh, I grew a lot of uh, chili peppers. And so I was always fascinated with trying to grow new varieties, the hottest peppers I could with the, the characteristics that I wanted and uh, this was largely what kept me outside during the, you know, the worst of the heat uh, in Arizona. So during the summertime. So um, my dad was the, the one who first introduced me to uh, growing jalapenos and serranos. And from there, it, it just, it really stuck. But by the time it was uh, time to apply for college, I wasn't quite sure how to make my career or my, my hobby into a career. I was kind of the mindset that unless I wanted to be a farmer, I didn't really know what to do. So I applied to Arizona State University, and I always had a passion for, for understanding the natural world. And so I ended up joining a research lab under Dr. Chad Johnson, where I was actually researching black widow spiders and um, their siblicide um, in urban versus rural populations. But it was also at ASU that I met uh, Dr. Ken Sweat, who was a botanist by training. And he was the first one who really introduced me into plant pathology, talking about a lot of the um, history of uh, plant epidemics and human history and human civilization. Um, and so as soon as I was introduced to this, this wonderful field, I, I, it started to click. It's like, I, I can stick to my hobby. I can pursue my passion for research and scientific method. And I can have a career that has an impact, a real world impact, um, hopefully uh, leading to food and economic security. So in 2019, I was able to join uh, the Chi Lab here at Purdue in the Botany and Plant Pathology Department. And uh, we are mainly focused on soybean diseases. Um, and we are uh, a USDA lab that runs what's called the Uniform Soybean Tests. And this is a, a, a place where breeders can submit their lines um, that they want to bring to market. And we perform large scale yield trials and coordinate across state lines so that uh, breeders can get a lot of data on their varieties before they, they uh, uh, bring them to market. So uh, yeah. So soybean plays host to many different pathogens of the various uh, groups that I described earlier. And so over the past two decades, uh, the Cooperative Extension Service and public universities have done a fantastic job of keeping track of the losses attributable um, to each of them. And so what we can see is a, a pie chart that kind of describes uh, some of the major diseases and problems that soybean faces. Um, and I like the pie chart because it, uh, it it's a great analogy. Each pathogen that can infect a plant is kind of taking a, a piece of the pie which we might call attainable yield, the theoretical yield that we should be seeing every year if pathogens weren't there. And so as plant pathologists, we study how to stop the pathogens from eating all the pie. 
Um, and my focus particularly is on this serious group of diseases or pathogens uh, called seedling diseases. And they're actually the second most um, destructive disease on soybean um, behind something called soybean cyst nematode, which is a uh, roundworm, a microscopic roundworm. And uh, so seedling diseases are a broad, a broad diagnosis. Um, they're actually caused by multiple pathogens, whereas in the previous examples, I showed one pathogen with one disease. This actually has a whole complex of pathogens that cause um, the same exact disease, which is a, a, a general uh, decline of seedlings shortly after they're planted or shortly after they emerge from the soil. And so here in the Midwest, we deal with three primarily, uh, namely Fusarium graminearum, Pythium irregulari, as well as Pythium ultimum, of which there's actually two uh, different and uh, unique varieties. So it just makes, adds to the complexity of, uh, of studying these things. And so the trouble is um, each of these three species likes different temperatures and respond differently to fungicides and usually have different life cycles um, than one another. So one management strategy is often difficult uh, to control all of these pathogens uh, simultaneously. And that's why we see it as such a big, um, has such a big effect on soybean yields. And so when I talk about disease management, um, what I'm really talking about is integrated pest management. And so these are all of the different strategies that we use normally in a combination that help to reduce the favorability of the environment for a disease or a pathogen to develop, as well as to um, promote resistance of the host plant. And so when I talk about something called cultural control, these are all of the things that a farmer or grower can do um, in order to make the environment kind of inhospitable to the pathogens. So a lot of these pathogens need a, a high moisture uh, content in the soil in order to germinate and to survive without drying out. Um, so deciding to plant in drier soils might be something that we would call a management strategy. Um, when we talk about chemical control, that's the application of pesticides, which directly target um, the pathogens that we don't want on our plants. And so in seedling diseases, this is typically uh, applied as a seed treatment. So the seeds are dipped in the pesticide preventatively before they're planted out in the field. And there's some worries with that. Um, anytime we talk about pesticides, we're worried about the ecological impact um, as well as the impact on public health. Um, and, and how these pesticides can affect uh, human health, as well as the, the health of all, what we would call off-target organisms, aka any organism that is affected by these pesticides that is not um, the pathogen that we're trying to control. We also have what are called biological controls, and this is where we have microbes fighting other microbes. And so certain uh, microbes have been found to be antagonistic to the pathogens and to outcompete them. Um, in seedling diseases, this is primarily in the soil, um, which the soil is full of all sorts of micro, microorganisms. And so we can do things to try to, to promote um, healthy microbiomes as well as apply biological controls um, that can suppress the pathogens. And then this final point, genetic control, is a huge um, part of integrated pest management, trying to pick the best varieties that are naturally resistant um, to the pathogens. But when it comes to seedling diseases, we don't actually have any varieties um, that have been developed um, that have resistance to these pathogens. Um, so that's where knowing that we have this knowledge gap, that's where my dissertation research picks up. And so um, what we have here is some examples of soybean seedling diseases. We can see this, the seedling has is in the process of collapsing. Um, and if we dig this seedling up, we see that the roots are just this rotted mass um, completely infested with the pathogen and the tissue is all necrotic, it's stunted, and we see this girdling, which is kind of a pinching in of the tissue. And this really affects the, the ability of the plant to absorb water and minerals and the normal healthy function of the roots. And so a lot of the times it ends up being completely lethal for the soybean. So it doesn't yield anything and it's a huge loss um, to the growers and the producers. And so in order to try to develop genetic control, first we have to find which varieties are resistant. So then we can try to find genes and then hopefully transplant those into higher yielding varieties um, that we wanna grow. And so in 2019, I set off to the farm and uh, collected a bunch of isolates. And uh, you can see those in these Petri bits I have imaged here, um, isolated from uh, soybean seedling tissue. 
um, to, in order to get those seedling pathogens that we want to screen for resistance for. And so next, um, you know, I have my isolates and I have the pathogens I want to work with. And we had a collaborator in agronomy who was able to help us uh, select a panel of genetically diverse soybeans that we could use um, to screen for resistance. So most of the soybean that's grown in North America currently is, is evolved from a very small genetic stock. So in order to find novel mutants and variants and genes that are not already present in the soybean that we grow, you have to look outside of what's normally grown. And so genetic diversity is kind of the key to finding that resistance. And we were able to secure 208 varieties um, from the USDA soy, soybean gene germplasm collection, excuse me. And these all originated from across the world. So um, some are from China, from Japan. We have some from India, all over Europe, Russia, um, South America, and uh, I could go on and on. But we also needed varieties that were going to grow in the Midwest growing conditions, because this is where we, we plan to do our experiments. And so with the pathogen secured and my panel of soybeans, I set about kind of screening all of these different varieties um, for resistance. And, and what that involved was setting up in the greenhouse uh, a, a trial where we took the varieties and we exposed them to the pathogen and then we let them grow in the same exact environment without exposure to the pathogen. And uh, to kind of get a control uh, uh, sense of how the plants would grow under our experimental conditions. And we used infested rice grains to basically put the, the, the seeds in contact with the pathogen. And what you can see in the upper left here is a, a zoomed in photo of a soybean that's emerging from our planting substrate. And this stuff that looks like a phase or a hog, uh, a, a, a fog um, in the hold beneath the stem, that's actually uh, mycelium of the pathogen. So that's the pathogen growing and actively infecting our, our soybean varieties. And so we're able to compare controls versus inoculated plants and take a measurement of their root weight, because as the pathogen are eating the roots, obviously the, the plant is losing biomass, what we call the, the weight of the roots. And so you can then divide the weight of the inoculated plants by the weight of the control plants. And that gives you an excellent ratio of how well a variety does when it's exposed to the pathogen versus how well the variety does when it's not exposed to the pathogen. And so if that ratio is closer to one, we have uh, lines that did almost as well as their controls. If it's closer to zero, that means they pretty much died and there was no root. And uh, we were successful in finding varieties that were resistant. So in the in the upper right, um, we have a, a, a gradient of resistance reactions, where in the upper left, we have a variety. Each of these pictures is a single variety, all inoculated with the same pathogen. And in the upper left, we have uh, a variety that whose roots are, are very healthy. We almost see no symptoms in all but one of the one of the plants. And then on the far right, we have one that is very, very susceptible to the pathogen where the, the roots are completely stunted and, uh, and have um, degraded in, in, in the uh, uh, presence of the pathogen. And so plant root weight isn't strictly determined by pathogen resistance. Some varieties just uh, produce bigger roots. And uh, but because we used ratios of the, of the inoculated to the controls, we're able to directly compare those ratios across the different varieties. And so here is all of those ratios plotted for the Fusarium graminearum resistance screening. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll only focus on the Fusarium graminearum, not the other two pythiums, but we did the exact same thing with the, with the pythiums. It's just uh, the results are not shown here. Um, and so this data is great. Um, it shows a continuous distribution of resistance from highly resistant lines on the left and uh, highly susceptible lines on the right. And this is great if it's something we want to do to find genes for resistance. Um, and so we can apply this linear mixed model here, and that will tell us which of these lines is actually uh, the most uh, sig significantly resistant. It's just a simple uh, statistical procedure we can use to um, compare lines and see which ones are uh, repeatably resistant to the pathogen. And lo and behold, we were able to find eight significantly resistant lines. Um, these are not 
uh, lines that are normally grown by farmers. A lot of these are um, what we call land races, which are locally adapted varieties from across the world. But uh, how they performed against the pathogen was uh, much better than the mean of uh, uh, all of the soybeans that we tested. And so um, what we can see here is uh, all of the names of those different lines um, and then uh, the focus on the eight from, from this ratio. And so how can we actually map which genes in the soybean genome are responsible for these this resistance that we're seeing? Um, so my first attempt uh, is to use what's called a genome-wide association study. And this is just a fancy way of, of looking at what we call markers, which are a generic term for um, heritable and as well as detectable shifts in the DNA, which we can try to find associations with our trait of interest. Scattered throughout the genome, which is just a bunch of chromosomes made up of DNA, which is A's, T's, G's, and C's, are these peculiarities called single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we, we, we just shorten that to SNPs. Um, and all that means is there are certain varieties that at that location, they have A's, whereas other varieties have T's. And because we know how heredity works, we know that genes are, are linked to these markers. So if we can track these markers, we can also track the, the genes that are linked um, to these markers. And SNPs are great and they're super frequent throughout the genome um, and they're relatively stable over time. And they can be easily detected on what we call a DNA microarray. And um, this is just a, a, a very fancy piece of genomic technology, which has a bunch of probes on it which can read these uh, individual markers and then fluoresce different colors depending on, on what the marker value is at those different locations. And we eventually get back this, this file, which has all of my varieties um, that I screened for resistance and then 42,000 different SNP markers and how those varieties scored at each of those markers. So um, throughout the genome, we have 42,000 places we can test for where resistance genes are. And so once we have those resistance scores and we have this genome-wide marker data, now we can perform the actual GWAS. And without getting too deep into the statistics, it's basically just an algorithm that's going to determine across all of those markers, which were associated with the higher levels of resistance and which were resist, uh, uh, associated with or, or had no effect on the, on the phenotype. And so if it's calculating if the mean resistance of varieties with the markers um, is statistically higher than those with the opposite marker. And again, since we know how heredity works, if a marker is significantly associated with resistance, then there's likely that there's a gene nearby um, that's the cause of that effect. And lo and behold, again, we had success. And so five SNP markers were associated with resistance um, to Fusarium graminearum. And on the right here, we have a table showing those markers that were uh, associated with the resistance. Uh, which of the alleles at each of those SNP markers was, um, was uh, the positive effect. And so if we look at this first one, we can see that there's a marker on chromosome two. The allele that you want to have is a G, and then that effect is about 3%. So on average, if that line has that, that marker, it's going to do 3% better when inoculated with Fusarium graminearum, which seems like it's a low amount, but when we add this up, we start to see cumulative effects. And sure enough, that's what we observed. So if we go back to those resistant varieties that were uh, significant, if you look at all of the different markers that these varieties had, sure enough, if they had more resistance markers, they scored the best. So this mean RRW score is that ratio that I was talking about earlier. So this one that had all the markers did the best in the, in the test. And this one that had fewer markers and an overall effect of 16% did the worst um, of the of the significantly resistant ones. So that's that's good evidence that uh, what we're seeing here is associated with resistance. And so up next, we need to confirm these results and we'll need to narrow down on the, the flanking regions around these markers. And that will allow us to pick out which genes are probably uh, responsible for that resistance that we're, that we're finding. And from there, it's a process of uh, testing those genes, knocking them out, cloning them, and figuring out what their, their biochemical function is um, in order to determine how they confer resistance and um, they can be bred um, into modern varieties. And so I'm, I'm working on this project. What we have here is um, 
uh, what we call QTL mapping um, or association mapping. And it just involves hybridizing resistant and susceptible lines um, and then tracing how resistance is conferred to the progeny. So which genes are absolutely es essential to the, to the offspring of a resistant and a susceptible cross in order for resistance to make it to the next generation. Once we have that data, it's good evidence that uh, that the genes that are being passed on are indeed uh, associated with that resistance and, and something we should follow up on. And so with that, I'd like to conclude and thank my graduate committee, Drs. Kai, Talenko, Ma, and Joe Hall for all their support and their advice throughout this process. It's a long and laborious process um, and, and, and they've been there with me every step of the way. I'd also like to thank the numerous undergraduate students who helped me with uh, a lot of the tasks and experimental setup that I couldn't possibly have done on my own. And so I wish them all uh, great success on, on all of their journeys. And lastly, I'd like to thank my family for uh, putting up with me through all the highs and lows of, of research and patiently supporting me from afar um, while I chase this dream. So, and then thank you again, uh, Dr. Soares for hosting me on this Purdue uh, lecture hall series and allowing me to talk today. Uh, thank you, Chris. This was awesome. And I'm so uh, enthused by your walk of history here, which was <laughs> such an eye opener. I learned so much, actually, from you taking us through that passage. I wonder if, uh, let's see if you can uh, stop sharing your screen so that like mm -hmm. that we can get back to the side-by-side -side view here. Absolutely. Yeah. But so tell us a little bit, I mean, th th you must be passionate about uh, exploring some of that history. Uh, something must have struck you about that uh, history and our our way of being able to uh, find uh, find clues in, in in that historical account. Uh, what drove you to that? Uh, yeah, so uh, it really was my introduction. I'm so sorry. I'm struggling here to to oh, stop. No problem. Here. It should be on the uh, share screen. I think what needs to happen is I need to exit presentation mode here. Let's okay, see. let me just. Uh... Here we go. Okay, oh, there you go. The screen. There All we right. go. Thank you. Yes, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, no problem. so what, what uh, got me into the history was um, actually my mentor back at ASU, Dr. Uh, Ken Sweat, he taught a, a plants and civilization course, which did a great job of introducing me to all of the epidemics throughout history. And I was just so unaware um, of, of the tremendous impact that agricultural disease has on just every facet of human civilization. Yeah. I mean, whether it be awful things like famine or uh, th even ecological impact, like, like I said, with the chestnut blight, I mean, we're, we're losing plants every day. And these, these things, even though they're, they're largely invisible to us in, in, in day to day life, um, they have such an impact. And so to be a part of being able to study that, I mean, the more I read, the more I got passionate about, Hey, how can I contribute to this? How can I, you know, try and help uh, address this problem? So. That's wonderful. Wonderful. What a great way to get inspired to get into it even more and and understand, you know, some of the underpinnings of the work that you're doing, which is so fascinating. What's your favorite part about it? Oh, my goodness. It's it's hard to choose. I am a huge fan of trying uh, to find the genes themselves. It's it's this mystery of once you observe that certain plants are more resistant, it's it's this mystery of trying to figure out, okay, what what is it in this plant that is causing this to happen? And yeah. and can we actually kind of leverage that and move it into other plants? I mean, it's it's it feels like a, a frontier. I feel sometimes more of like an explorer than a scientist when I'm trying to, you know, discover uh, uh, some of the, some of the genes and, and, and other things. So. Yeah. You know, and, and it's such a, it's such a unknown place still, right? I mean, you're mm -hmm. going after uh, signatures of genes and still to understand how they participate in the whole 
physiology and and disease it's so fascinating i think you've you've done a great job chris of showing us uh the the detailed uh approaches and the the techniques that you're using to go after some of these genes mm-hmm. um it, do you need to know a lot of statistics? It sounds to me like from some of the work you're doing, uh, you should be prepared at least to have good background in statistics to go after these things. Certainly. And uh, I can say um, prior to joining this program, I, I did not have, um, a, aside from the general prerequisites for biological sciences, Um, I did not have uh, a background in statistics. So this has been a learning process and I've had great mentors here at Purdue um, that have really uh, been able to help me catch up with all of the tools that I need um, specifically for this this, uh, topic in plant pathology. Not every topic is is necessarily going to need um, as heavy of a statistics, but when we're talking about applying linear models and, and applying GWAS, a lot of that is, is really statistics heavy, but we have a great team here at Purdue. Um, shout out to Dr. Mosin Mohammadi, who is an excellent quantitative geneticist here uh, at Purdue in the agronomy department, who really helped me with uh, uh, understanding the, the nuances of GWAS and how, how to use it as a tool. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah. how how could he not? I uh, with a superstar like you, Chris <laughs> Dieternaltes. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for uh, giving us this lesson and uh, letting us peer a little bit into the history of plant diseases and diseases uh, in general, and a little history also on your background and what has inspired you to pursue this career. Uh, Congratulations on all your success so far. And we're looking forward to seeing what comes next for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Soros. And and thank you for having me on today. It's it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Well, have a great day. See you You as well. Thank you for watching the Purdue Lecture Hall series. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.